Hi, it's Steve Hargadon, and it's day three of the sixth annual Global Education Conference. We're so delighted to be here. In this hour, we welcome dear friend Julie Lindsay and new friend Katie Grubb. Welcome to both of you. Uh, good morning, Steve. Good morning, everybody. It's fairly early over here. Katie and I are both in the same time zone, and it's just gone 5 a.m., but we're really pleased to be here. Thank you. We appreciate your getting up early. So delighted to hear from you. Julie Lindsay is a global collaboration consultant, a teacherpreneur, an innovator, a leader, and an author. She's worked as an education and digital technology leader in six different countries across Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. Katie is with Mandarin Pathways and Southern Cross School of Distance Education. She collaborates with other educators designing learning experiences that connect young people to real-world projects, providing platforms for youth to have a voice and a place in their community. We'd like to thank our sponsors and supporters this year. They make such a difference. They provide uh, not just financial support to make the conference possible, but they're good friends and they help us accomplish this terrific task of a worldwide peer-to-peer -peer conference event. So thanks to VIF International Education, to TEZ, and to our two founding co-sponsors, the Global Campaign for Education, the United States Chapter, and IRN USA, and the others listed here. We hope you'll express your appreciation to them in some way. For those of you who are participating live, this is your chance to indicate where you're located in the world. Click to the left of the map on the star icon, and click on the map. It takes two clicks usually. You click the star icon, it opens out to some other icons. You're welcome to pick a different one. The smiley face, the pointed finger. And let us know where you are in the chat. Govinda in Nepal. Please keep those notes going in the chat. But we're going to move forward here so that Julie and Katie can get started. OK, we'll turn the time over to the two of you. Thank you, Steve. It's Julie here. And welcome, everybody. We're really excited to be doing this keynote. And uh, Katie, let's hear from you. Let's just make sure you've got audio again, and then we'll move forward. Hi everybody, um, thanks for having me here and just testing my microphone. That's great, thanks Katie. All right, so Katie and I want to talk to you about, uh, talk with you, talk to you about this um, collaborative we've developed called Connect with China. We want to talk about uh, the global perspectives that are developing in the teachers and students and just share our general excitement with you about this and global learning in general. So, Katie, I'm going to pass back to you now to talk more about where you've come from and what's been happening. Thanks. Okay, hi everyone. Um, oh, it feels strange saying meet Katie Grubb. Actually, I, I, I just want to talk about how I met Julie really quickly. I saw Julie at a conference a few years ago and thought she was an outstanding speaker and went up and gave her a bit of kudos for that and um, asked her if if she had considered doing what she was doing kind of with a, with a China focus. And so that's how we started. So my background is, um, you know, I did a traditional university degree, Bachelor of Business and Arts, and, and majored in Chinese. And then I went on to my grad, grad dip in teaching and I did my CELTA course. But as you can see over in the, in the right-hand side, I've done a lot of other things in my life. And, you know, more and more that's how life is is going, how do we define ourselves and our, you know, up, upcoming learners that are, that will be, you know, studying, um, it's quite likely they're going to have many different roles in life and many different identities and um, so I think it's, it's going more global and how we define ourselves is, 
is becoming, you know, broader. Um, and a few years ago, I launched a, an organisation called Mandarin Pathways, and so I probably put all those skills into that organisation. And basically, it's about building um, global perspectives with youth, and in particular, I work in regional Australia, so you know, it's building those perspectives in young people who wouldn't normally get exposed to kind of a global ex perspective. And obviously, Mandarin Pathways has a China focus. And we run a, quite a few programs like community language and culture, um, exchange programs. Um, we do online learning. And we also work with businesses to help them become a bit more China ready. Um, yeah. OK. so. Um, if you can develop in your students a sense of the opportunities that are available beyond Australia's borders or the borders of your own country, then as a consequence, they'll become, they will more likely take advantage of these in the future. And that's, you know, I feel as an educator, that's what I really want to expose my kids to. Um, and for me, I was, I was quite lucky. I grew up with, with a family where, we travelled quite a bit and we travelled so much in fact that I actually didn't even go to school until sixth grade. Um, but once I went into school, I, I caught up fairly quickly and um, it really made me think about the education system and, and how much, you know, if, if I can miss half of my education, formal education, but still finish and graduate and get a university degree and, and be quite fine in life, then um, there's got something that's got to be said about, you know, just learning in the real world and having that space to figure things out for yourself and develop a responsibility for your own, own learning and to find your own, you know, passions that you can follow. So I really try to try to give that to my students as well. Um, and so when even though I had that, that upbringing in my earlier years, um, actually in my teenage years ended up in a really small redneck military town in Australia. And obviously I felt like I was a bit of, I love that he's a friend there, but I obviously felt like there was just something missing. You know, life was pretty much about going to football and binge drinking. So I had to get out and China was where I went to. And the reason I, <laughs> I just read your comment, Lucy Gray, yes, we do have those in Australia. Um, so I, I just, I left and I went to China and, you know, life, life really changed. And I took, I was, I was very empowered to be able to do that. And I guess I put this slide in there just to show you that I was able to do that because I had that upbringing, which was global. I, you know, I'd already developed very global perspectives. So, I was able to wake up in the morning and go, I'm going to change something. I, I want to learn something new and I'm, I'm going to be able to do this. And, um, and a lot of people who haven't had that chance are, um, are not able to do that so easily. And, you know, they can sometimes get a little stuck. And luckily with what Julie and I have developed and what many educators are embarking on and doing as well, we're being able to provide an experience for, for young people where they don't actually, young people and educators, they don't actually have to get up and leave their town to um, develop those global perspectives. So they can actually do it using technology. Julie, I might hand it over to, to you here. Thanks, Katie. And the funny thing is, you know, Katie and I actually live 10 minutes away from each other. Uh, I'm actually down in a conference at the moment on, on um, about an hour's flight. I'm actually sitting in a hotel room as I do this now. But but the funny thing is, so Katie and I have developed this, but we live so close to each other. We can drive and have coffee and we can meet. So it, there's a nice little um, element to what we've developed together in our friendship. But anyway, a little bit about me. I know a lot of you know me already, but um, uh, you know I've been doing global collaboration for many years and I've... I've uh, developed uh, a number of things now under the Slack Connections umbrella. I'm also doing my education doctorate, which is quite exciting. And I'll just share very briefly with you. I've had my research approved. I'm launching into that. Uh, we've done phase one of my design uh, research, um, and I'm launching into phase two interviews very 
doing and uh, just just uh, this is an important part of my life at the moment so I really want to share eventually with people what I know is working and what I'm seeing and observing and being part of with educators. But I really want to document that in a more formal um, research based way. Barbara says it's hard to hear. I'm hoping I'm okay. I hope I'm coming across okay. It's gotten better. Oh, I think loads. your headset oh, was okay. uh, displaced. Okay. All right. Let me just... Uh, okay. Thank you. All right. So um, I'm also an author. The, the book from three years ago, Flattening Classrooms, Engaging Minds, is still um, a, rel a very um, relevant uh, guide to global collaboration. And just a quick plug, there's a new book coming out called The Global Educator, which is being published by ISTE early next year. And that actually is full of stories, including the story about the Global Education Conference and um, stories of educators connecting with the world and connecting their students with the world, etc. So watch out for that for next year. Uh, just a little bit more about my background. I know uh, I didn't have any, a global upbringing, but uh, in my 30s, I did leave Australia. My husband is also a teacher, so we just uh, we sold our house and took our three-year-old daughter and said, right, that's it, we're going to Africa, which was a fairly brazen sort of thing to do. Uh, family were not particularly impressed, but there you go. And we thought we'd last a couple of years, but no, we were actually out of the country for 15 years. And I know some of you have heard this story before, but it was it became a journey, uh, learning about the world with the world, moving from Africa to the Middle East, uh, to Bangladesh, back to the Middle East in Qatar, and then across to China. So my my link with China actually goes back. You know, I was there on a trip in 1985, and some of you, if you know anything about China, you will, will understand how. That was really early days for people to visit China, and I travelled through China for three weeks in 1985, which was just a remarkable experience. And then I was actually lived in Beijing for three years, uh, from 2009 to 2012, which was also a remarkable experience in terms of moving what I was doing in other parts of the world to this country that had uh, different sort of uh, technology um, restrictions. The firewall. We're going to talk about that in a minute as well, and uh, you know, working within within the system, but also with the way that I do it, sort of trying to break the system as well. So, so but the, you know, the message is, and Katie's already said it: uh, you don't actually need to leave home to become a global educator learner. And this is such an important message uh, as we move through this presentation, because you know, even though Katie and I may have travelled a lot. Uh, it's not an essential requirement. You can still develop global competency and global experiences and, and reach out globally. As you all know, if you're in this room, you are already a global educator and you're participating in these global events. Um, and I'm going to, let's see, where are we up to now? Oh, I'm going to pass to you, Katie, because I think I've got a street cleaner coming down the road and we're going to get a bit of noise in a minute. So I'm going to pass to you to move to the next section. Thank you. Katie, we're wondering if your microphone is turned on. There okay, my mic's on. Sorry, guys. Yeah, so our story, you've, probably, you've had time to read part one, part two, part three, right, by now. So I'll just move on. Part one, the importance of global connections to foster global understanding. You know, obviously, uh, why we want to do that is people view the, the world very differently and they behave in the world very differently. But at the, at the end of the day, our core is, is the same. We all really want the same things. So if, once we can understand someone else's different perspective, then it enables us to build empathy and, and um, be able to relate in different ways to find those different ways to relate to people that from those different parts of the world. Um, and yeah, but even though I put this slide up because if you read if you read any stuff that's coming out from the World Economic Forum and you know you're aware of what's happening in the education arena, you know technology and and things outside of school have changed so rapidly. Yet our school system is still structured on on, on quite an an old way. So the gap that we've got between what's happening inside most of our educational institutions and actually outside in the real world is, is quite, 
quite a big gap at the moment and you know 21st century learning um is what they what they call it in Australia and they've brought that in as a new type of curriculum to try and fill that fill that gap fill that gap up um and it's not about just in, you know adding on some of the elements of that curriculum to our existing courses it's about kind of unpacking them and looking at them and rethinking and redesigning them and when you do that and you look at if you really unpack 21st century learning you'll really soon realize that what what they're talking about is qualities and aspects that are really similar to the qualities of entrepreneurship which is a skill set that our young people are going to really need more and more as they as they grow particularly actually in the western countries um as our work environments change we we need to make sure that our young people are really tapped into innovation and have um some of the skill sets that yeah young jao talks a lot about that if you guys are familiar with him and if not you know I give him a give him a google and have um a read of some of his works I find it quite interesting um and yeah so you can read those yourself on there and I'm going to hand over to Julie All right so Katie and I have developed uh what we call Connect with China collaborative and our hashtag is China Connect you can if you look at the hashtag in Twitter Twitter you can go back and see some of the things we've been tweeting recently uh but given you know you know a little bit more about our backgrounds now uh this became sort of a, a, a an imperative that we get together and build something build these bridges between the rest of the world and China and I want to talk a little bit about the background because you know sometimes these these stories are quite interesting um I did the google um certified teacher academy or whatever it was called just over 12 months ago and part of what I did uh was with you and Macintosh's team notosh notosh.com and we did this design thinking and moonshot thinking so we were asked as as educators in this uh seminar two day seminar what is your moonshot what what is it that you really want to do in education that will start to change and influence um and we have to come up with a statement so i was trying to think more broadly well i've already flattened flattening learning for many educators what what else can i do what's still missing um so i came up with a statement how might we flatten the learning environment to include connected and collaborative practices for learners everywhere in order to deepen understanding about the world now the key point there is the piece in green uh learners everywhere that's still too low good morning sorry steve i'll keep moving closer to my mark um I think we might okay I could turn that up a bit how's that that a bit better I hope that's better yes great okay sorry about that all right so nothing worse than having low audio I know all right all right so learners everywhere was the, was the the key thing to me because I'm seeing I'm still seeing so many times where students learners are missing out because perhaps their teachers are not ready to jump in to global education they're not ready to to take students on that journey uh and perhaps certain people in schools are not ready to to support them yet but through this idea of a collaborative I'm trying to flatten the learning even further by giving people opportunities to come in and be collaborative and connect in different ways so as it says there an alternative approach to connected and collaborative learning that joins learners of all ages across the globe and that was that's been the goal from the start So when we put together this uh connect with China uh we wanted this to be interdisciplinary cross curricular cross age so we really are we have students uh, as young as grade got grade 5 we've definitely got a lot of grade 6 students and we've got students right up to grade 11 or year 11 maybe you describe it in your your system uh it's a thematic approach uh we we have actually students who have come in independently we've we've got teachers who've come in independently our uh, teachers in schools who said hey we want to find out more about this we don't have students at the moment but we want to come in and just work with you and and be part of this course so it's not classroom based necessarily although in this pilot that we're running this semester we do have uh, a lot of teachers with their classes of course yes homeschoolers as Katie said and distance education students as well so giving them 
a, a, an alternative way to join a global um, group of learners. Of course, it's digital technology infused, um, and we, we're not just, it's not just students and teachers, but it does include the extended community. So, and I'm sorry, this is a lot of text uh, up on the, up on the screen here. In fact, if you go to uh, our website, I'll just throw that in the, in the chat now for you to have a quick look at. Uh, there is a lot of material up on the website as well. But, you know, we, we've got this focus on Chinese, not just language. You know, we have some uh, students' classes with us who are particularly focused on the, the language acquisition, but the culture and the society. But not just traditional culture, but contemporary culture as well. And that's a really important part of what we do. Um, I won't read all of that out, but, you know, we, we do want to take learners on a journey with us, you know, what, how do we connect, how do we communicate and collaborate, uh, and particularly with this, you know, China has so many different um, challenges as a country, as a, as a group of, of, of learners. And, and by doing this, by going um, on this um, journey, you know, we do want to build understanding of the world and our individual and perhaps national uh, relationship with China. So we can look at ourselves as individuals, how we connect with China, and also how we connect as, in terms of our culture and our nation, which is uh, which are two different things in fact. And to build confidence, trust, and cultural awareness. Uh, we, those of you who, there may not be anyone here in the room because it is so early, it's 20 past 5 in the morning here in Australia on the East Coast, uh, but we have uh, linked this with the Australian curriculum, which is our new national Australian curriculum in terms of the general capabilities, intercultural understanding, ethical understanding, ICT capability, personal and social capability, create, critical and creative thinking, etc. You can Google the Australian national curriculum and you will find these. It's, it is a very good read. <laughs> yeah, that's a, it, it is very early for Katie and I, but you know, we're, we're putting it together, I think, Katie. It's okay, don't worry. <laughs> So a couple more things for me that I'm going to pass to Katie. What we've done with this collaborative is we've brought in uh, teachers, of course, who have their classes, teachers who are independent, community members, um, etc. And rather than saying, well, here's our teacher group, we, we're using this term, and I do like this term, called learning concierge. So the learning concierge, and that's Katie and I as well, are the bridge between the learners. Okay, so how can we bridge learners in our immediate vicinity with learners um, in different parts of the world? How can we, if we don't have our own students, how do we just bridge learners generally? And that includes teachers and, and educators as well. So the learning concierges are also working in a flat learning environment with the student learners or the, the younger learners of all ages. You know, we repost ideas, uh, share multimedia, um, supporting the understanding of China. We have a number of learning concierges based in China as educators and community members. Uh, together we facilitate teamwork. Uh, together we work out digital issues. And together we work through our uh, timeline for this collaborative, which, which has you know, a definite beginning, middle, and, and productive sort of I'm going to pass to you to talk about this and the partnerships. Thank you. One of the key um, key components of the Connect with China Collaborative is working with our community partners. And this gives our, the people involved in the project a connection to the real world, not just in a conceptual way, but an actual real connection. And the awesome thing about using technology is obviously uh, we can, people, people can connect from across the world. Some of those groups there, there's, there's one group here, uh, I'm going to circle it, oh cool, Green Initiative, they're based in Shanghai and their whole world is about, um, yeah, Green Initiative, sustainability initiatives that are inside China, and so that's a very interesting one for our group. And down here we've got the Ruyo Bay Surf Club, and yeah, believe it or not, there's actually surf in China and they have surf clubs, and this surf club's really interesting because they have they teach a group of um, Aboriginal or Indigenous children surfing as well. And so we've got some emergent kind of popular youth subcultures in our Connect with China Collaborative too. 
And, you know, we found that by finding people in the community who are absolutely passionate about what they do and, you know, masters at what they do too, they extend that learning beyond what we can offer as educators and then the kids get to ask them questions directly and, and have that kind of instant learning experience. Um, yeah, and our theme this year with the Connect with uh, China, China Collaborative is really exploring that concept of thinking global and acting local. So looking at global global issues such as, you know, pollution or um, a lot of those issues that affect us all globally and then looking at brainstorming ideas and how we can then apply that locally to help create some positive change. So I'm also going to um, hand over to Julie here who can chat a little bit more about that with you guys. Yes, so this our theme uh, for the pilot this semester really allows uh, learners in the collaborative to look at their immediate environment and then compare and contrast with the other learners that they're connecting with in terms of their communities. And we're, we're coming up to share with you some of the, um, the topics and the subtopics that we're looking at as well. But um, it's really looking at this from a, um, a social, uh, well, social entrepreneurship point of view in, to an extent. But looking at you know, your your daily life and consumption patterns, how does that impact the environment? Uh, what what is it that we can? Is there anything we can do together? Are there, are there any solutions we can come up? with? With together that will eventually, if we implement them or partly implement them, uh, improve our lives, improve the planet, etc. So, so you know, we have these. It's not uh, just about getting learners together to chat about their, the fact. Yes, well, you like pizza. Oh, gee, I like pizza too. Which often is as far as a global collaboration goes in some some aspects of it. Some in some cases, but it, it goes. This one goes a lot deeper. You know, it's not just about liking pizza and oh, you you watch the same game and oh, you have a dog as well. That's interesting. That's, which is really interesting when you realise that someone in China might do the same things that you're doing. But we dig a lot deeper with this collaborative, and we really are asking learners of all ages to consider their position uh, in the world and their actions in the world. Uh, a little bit about the tools, um, Katie. I'm going to pass to you about this because I know you. You've got more of an insight. Over to you. Oh yeah, so uh, obviously when we're dealing with uh, Australia and China and USA and a whole, a whole lot of different countries and we're dealing with firewalls and as well. So we've got to find the digital to tools to how to connect. Uh, and I'm not sure how it works over in other countries, but in Australia our education system also has a very, very heavy firewall. It's pretty much a closed system. For example, in our state schools, um, we we can't access Skype and, and a whole range of other tools. So we're talking about a very, very narrow pathway of connection. Um, and no no one's actually attempted to do what Julie and I are doing at the moment in, in Australia and connect um, with China and, and other countries. So We've, we've had to play around with a few different things and we found our favourite tools that we work are Edmodo Padlet, VoiceThread, WeChat. If you haven't heard of WeChat, it's similar to WhatsApp but better. And there's Fuse and Skype. And obviously the schools in China, a lot of those ones um, using VPNs, um, we, they, they can sort of bypass the firewall and we find that we can access a whole lot of other schools. Um, and what we found in Australia with our participants is a lot of them are independent schools and private type private schools. And you know, there's that question of our state schools being a little bit left behind because of that heavy kind of closed system. In fact, I had a, a chat with someone at at work in the state school system yesterday, and they were saying just that it was a, a senior manager, and they said, oh. Katie, we need to do a lot more of what you guys are doing because, um, you know, in, our education system is getting a little left behind at the moment. Well, something I wanted to talk about here, though, was that whole perception that China is cut off from the rest of the world and that they, you know, they're blocked from the rest of the world. 
lot. Um, and, and to an extent, they are, but to an extent, we also are as well. And so China has their own system in, you know, of Facebook and YouTube and all of those same things that, that we use as social platforms. They have them as well, just different types of versions inside of, of China. And, um, the, the funny thing is we can actually connect with them if we choose to. We're not actually blocked to be able to go and, and get on those, those, um, those tools. So in a sense, you know, the whole who's cut off from who, I think if we've got access to be able to, to connect with, with those guys, then, you know, perhaps we can make that, that step to do that, which we're not actually used to having to do in the Western world. We're used to people just coming over to our party. We're like, we've got the best party. Come over, everybody. Come over here. And, you know, obviously when they're not choo when they're choosing not to come over, it's like, oh, that's a bit of rejection. Well, we don't want to go to your party either. Um, and it's, it's a little political too because it's more about where is your personal data stored. So that's something Australian people are, are really not aware of is that most of our, in fact, all of our, our personal data is, is stored offshore over in the USA with a lot of the different applications and things that are used over there. And China, to a certain extent, it's just, they just put their foot down. This is why Google's, you know, it's not part of China at the moment. Um, they just put their foot, foot, foot down and said, no, we really want to keep the data of our own people. We don't want, you, we don't really want to hand that over to, to the USA. So it's, it's quite political as to how it all works, but there's still ways to connect. Yeah. In that one. Let's see what the next slide is. Oh, these are the tools, this picture of the tools they're using to connect with China even more so. I think Julie wants to That's add okay. something yeah, here. Just, um, I was just going to jump in and say, you know, when I, and I know you lived in China for 12 months, of course, Katie is a fluent Mandarin speaker, so she has that language, and she has this enhanced ability to not only speak, but also read uh, Chinese characters and communicate. I don't have that language ability, but I was just thinking, you know, when I lived in China for three years, uh, we, we, in a school, we were confronted with the, the Great Firewall and making those valuable connections out beyond China. But of course, you know, as Katie said, within China, you can still be part of all of their, their networks and, uh, you know, they, they have amazing things already happening within there. Uh, and to get over the firewall, we needed to have a VPN, virtual private network, so that we could uh, do our Facebook or whatever. But these are the tools that we've, we've found that are successful at the moment. Now, tools come and go. Google is completely blocked in China unless you have a VPN, and a lot of schools in China don't. It's actually not, not really uh, legal. The government don't really like you having a VPN, uh, so you have to be fairly careful how you, what you do there. Uh, but, but these tools at the moment are not blocked, and um, so VoiceThread, PhotoBucket, you know, WeChat, etc. And Fuse is another virtual room. Edmodo is, of course, great. I know many of you know Edmodo. This is uh, how we've built our community. WeChat, WeChat is actually very similar to WhatsApp. Some of you may know WhatsApp. And WeChat is like the Chinese version. And we've had the best connections through WeChat. We're getting very clear video of China to Australia uh, and China to the USA as well using, using WeChat. So that's, you know, that was one of our first challenges, working out this basket of tools where we can actually connect with China because there's no point saying, okay, we're going to do this on a Google platform and many of the other global projects I run, we do use Google. But in this case, no, you c we couldn't use Google. Uh, so we've, we've had to work this out as we go along. So I want to talk more about global perspectives and understanding and what we've really been doing with, uh, with this uh, collaborative. So just um, some some words here about and some images of what some of the students and the learners, the learners have been doing. So we have been in Edmodo, we've brought students, we've got three countries, USA, Australia and China in this collaborative at the moment. They're the three countries that put their hand up to, to connect with China. And students typically in Edmodo have been going in and introducing themselves and uh, talking about what do they know about China, what do they want to know, what do they want to ask their partners, uh, etc. So it's a typical sort of chat happening there. Uh, this is a student from um, China, born and still studying in China, 
Uh, this is a student from a school just out of Shanghai in Wuxi uh, that has come in. This is a, they're actually an international school, but they're, they, well, they call themselves an international, well, they're running an international curriculum. They are running the International Baccalaureate. All of their students do have Chinese passports, so in this case. So there are a number of different types of schools in China. And, you know, we're forging those connections through the, to who, who I know and through um, who Katie knows as well. So conversations developing here between students in China uh, with students outside of China, initially through Ed Mode. Uh, and then of course the conversations, not just talking about hello, how are you, where, what do you think, but now moving into our, our topics. So you can see there we're setting up teams, team 10, celebrations, team 1, water conservation. So students are starting to share images and ideas and, and uh, once again deepening the conversation in terms of what do you know, what's happening in your world, uh, what, what can we talk about with this topic. Uh, this one. This is a Yujin from a school in Yuwa in Yantai. This is another school that's in our collaborative from China. Yantai, and if you if you can visualise the map of China at all, Beijing is sort of up in the north, uh, and then there's this um, fairly popular place or well-known place called Dalian. Tom Friedman talks about Dalian, which is right over on the North Korean border, and then Yantai is like another little peninsula coming up that sort of almost touches Dalian, but it's back sort of on the other side. Uh, so that's a, I haven't been there myself, but that's where we have a school that is also communicating with our students and working with our students. So once again, it's beyond communication. It's, it's actually start, you're building up empathy so that students can work together. One of the ways that we've built up empathy is to do digital handshakes using tools like Animoto, using uh, whatever tools the, the students have available. Uh, many of the students in China and beyond China actually did PowerPoint uh, digital handshakes and uploaded the files to uh, to Edmodo, which is you know which is fine, fairly low tech approach, but it's still you know getting the message across. This is who we are. This is what we look like. We're yeah. ready to work with you. We've been now uh, also using VoiceThread, and this is just a screenshot of some of the VoiceThreads we initially set up for students and learners, uh, learning concierges as well, to also do digital handshakes and say hello. Uh, and also to practice their Chinese. Uh, a number of uh, people who've joined us do want that experience where the students get to practice their Chinese. And of course, we realised all of a sudden when we started this that the, the schools or learners in China who wanted to connect, to connect with us also wanted to practice their English. And I, it just sort of hit us with it. Of course, of course they do. So it's not all about Chinese. It's actually about that cross-cultural, well, okay, we're in China, but we really want to practice our English. Uh, Barbara, just looking at your message there, age groups, we've got as young as year six right up to, uh, so we look at that 10 years old, 10 to 18 at the moment. Um, can Julie, your microphone phone's gone a bit funny. Sorry, I'm not sure why I'm having trouble. Um, I was just going to say, do you want to let, let me just talk through this one. We're going to run out of time, I think, so let me keep going. So another thing um, we've been doing, apart from the asynchronous with Edmodo, asynchronous community building, um, many schools now have also been doing these real encounters, these uh, schools with Australia to China. This week and next week, actually, schools from USA and China are connecting in real time. So these have been very exciting, and this one is talking about uh, connecting with green initiatives. So they have their Year 7 class in an auditorium, connecting with uh, Nissan from Green Initiative. Uh, this is also actually the same school, connecting with one of our learning concierges who is an independent learner. Harry is actually an 18-year-old Australian living in Beijing, learning Chinese. He's actually lived in Beijing for about six years, but he's there now post-secondary school learning Chinese. So, so Students in Australia to connect with a fellow Australian in that capacity uh, was actually an extremely exciting session. The teachers have loved about it, and, and the learning that went on uh, was great there. And you know, just fostering those wow moments. And we know how real-time encounters can really foster those wow moments and continue to build empathy, so that students can say, "Okay, I understand these students, these other learners better now." I I think I'm ready to work with them. 
So once again, that's Jess's blog post. We will share these slides with you so you can grab these, uh, these links and have a deeper look if you're, if you're interested in doing that. Uh, just very quickly, uh, when you run a global collaboration, of course, of course, you need to be aware of global digital citizenship uh, requirements, et cetera, and things always happen. You know, the fact that things will happen has never stopped me running anything global. You just need to be aware and have some strategies. Now, this uh, project is bilingual. Uh, our collaborative uh, encourages Chinese and English speakers. We had a little uh, student, little year six student, having some banter with his classmates, uh, posted something using Chinese characters, uh, and it wasn't a particularly nice thing to post. So as a community, we dealt with it. Uh, we, um, Katie's a message there. Katie actually um, turned the student on to read only, while the classroom teacher spoke to the student and, and worked out what was going on. So, so once again, the message for people who are launching into global collaborative environments, uh, you know, the be aware of the fear factor. There's no point being fearful of this, but you do have, need to have some resources and strategies in place. Screenshotting is the best thing. Screenshot what's happened. Uh, if you need to block the student from posting anything else, do that. If it's bad enough to take the student down, you do that, etc. So we do have our systems in place for learners to be comfortable in this environment if something happens. Katie, I just over added to this you. slide in because when we're designing our learning programs and designing any of these type of programs, we really want to design the, the purpose and then share that as much as we can through social media. And obviously, you guys who are all in this presentation are probably all very active on on social media. Um, so, what one of the strategies that we actually employed was using we had to create this cover art for our different groups for voice threads. So we sized them up as to the same uh, pictures that you, you would then post on Twitter. So, you know, we could then share um, a little snapshot of our learning with the broader community, which has been really, really good. Um, and this is just, I'm just going to flick through really quickly and just show you some of the cover art. And these are also some of the sub themes and topics that ca have come from the Connect with China Collaborative. And these have actually come from the students as to what they want to look at. And obviously those sustainability themes and the think global, act local um, is, is threaded in, in these kind of bigger concepts. So, you know, China's, the kids are looking at aspects like what is China's green fence policy? Very interesting new, new policy that's been out for a while. And then they're comparing things like urban versus rural, um, different different ways of living in those areas and some of the problems that both areas face. Um, yeah, and Julie asked me to write here some of the highlights of, of, of China Connects. And obviously, I love this saying, it's very common, but technology makes the impossible possible of being, you know, of getting... Um, who would think, like, you know, when I travelled to China a few a, earlier this year and I was visiting our community partners for the very first time and just making those connections, it's been the most amazing thing to then see those community partners chatting to kids all over the world. And it's been amazing for them as well. It's given value to the work of, of what they're doing and realising, wow, we've got an amazing, amazing audience. We're going to keep going with the work that we're doing. And um, it, it inspires everyone and I think makes learning a whole lot stronger together. And Julie will have her own highlights about Connect with China, so I'm I'm gonna let her talk here a little bit too. Yeah, and this is and we're basically pretty much at the end of our presentation now, so we've left some time for for questions and, and any conversation you want to interact with us. But I think some highlights for me of this collaborative is the fact that we work together as a group of learners to really make these connections uh, happen. And th that has meant, you know, working through tools that we thought worked but didn't and then et cetera, um, working through um, uh, having te online teacher meetings as I often do with global uh, collaborations anyway, but bringing teachers, we've had some great meetings with teachers from the three countries, China, USA and Australia, in the same meeting. Uh, I remember our, our teacher from California, he has grade six students, year six students in the project. And, and when we talked about the, the meeting before about the, the great firewall, he hadn't heard that term before. And he went and Googled it and then he said, when I introduced that term to my grade year six students, we just spent the whole day talking about it. We just couldn't believe that um, what, you know, what 
that that was happening in China, and we looked at the um, implications for us here in the USA. He said, and he said, that's just really made made this collaborative for us because it just broadened our horizons. Uh, and we have, you know, there are a number of stories uh, throughout just the last two months uh, from participants in the collaborative. I know my friend Anne Murchison, who you, you will have seen Anne, Anne is very active uh, with this conference, uh, as she is with many things, and she had students in this collaborative, and Anne is a seasoned global, seasoned global collaborator, and for her, it's opened her uh, horizons even more as well, to be able to make these authentic, real-time and asynchronous connections uh, with learners in China, and also to connect with once again, another group of learners from across the world. So it's opened up our eyes in terms of how important this really is, coming back to uh, what Katie was saying earlier on, uh, how important this is to look at how we can embed these experiences into the general, formal and informal education of young people and uh, how we can encourage our individual schools, and then beyond that, our districts, our areas, our states, our countries. You know, we have in Australia, said we have a national curriculum that um, focuses on intercultural understanding. But then, what are people doing about that? That's the big question. That's what we're asking here in Australia. Of course, what are people actually doing to address what obviously very wise people have put into a, a, an official national document? Uh, and this is one way, this is a, one uh, exciting way to actually address that. Uh, yeah, let's think, see, what else have we got? Go ahead, Katie, go ahead. I was just going to say, obviously, intercultural understanding is something that you can talk about with your students, but, you know, through the Connected China Collaborative, they actually gain it from the experience of having to do it, but, but they're in a very held and nurtured space, so they can communicate and then see the learn from the rep repercussions of that communication and um, learn, yeah, learn from that before they are sort of doing that in a space that's not so held for them. That's right, it's coming out of that bubble, it's coming out of that, once again, which is why we do global collaboration, coming out of that, that sort of, this is what I know, this is what I think bubble, and making those valuable connections with people who know and think things differently. Uh, and this is where the words uh, globalisation, think global, uh, act local comes in as well. So in terms of the future, we're going to continue to uh, develop this collaborative. Uh, we have, I've just posted the, there's a form on our website if you're interested uh, in sharing your information with us if you want to join us or if you're just interested in finding out more, just being on our mailing list, etc. Uh, please uh, take a look at that. We have lots of ideas. Actually, Katie and I are planning to go to China again next year ourselves to make more connections and meet people over there face to face, so that we community members and schools, so that we can keep building this um, this whole connection, and so we do have ongoing valuable learning opportunities for people. And also bringing, Katie's also moving in her her realm, what she does, bringing people from China to Australia, which is a whole other interesting uh, aspect as well. So just looking at Barbara's comment there, we are coming up for questions now. Have there been cultural restrictions that have been difficult to allow for holistic in integration technology-wise? Um, um, not, not that I'm aware of. Um, the only cultural restrictions are the uh, I lack of understanding about other cultures at this point. Um, no, beside the firewalls, no. Uh, yes, China Connect is our, is our oops, China Connect is our hashtag there. Yep, great. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> and that shows. Okay, so I think um, over to you, Katie, to close off, but I think that's pretty much what we wanted to share with you. We're, we are really excited about this collaborative. Uh, we have a great set of learners taking the journey with us, and we're looking to next year, next semester, to keep building on this. Over to you, Katie. Oh, thanks, Julie. Oh, thanks, Julie. <laughs> okay, so I'm closing off. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, for coming and listening today, and... 
Um, big thank you all to participants in who joined the Connect with China Collaborative and, and the pilot program and you know being with it, being with us on a journey of finding all the digital tools that work best and going out of your comfort zone a little bit. It's been fantastic to see the learning that's come out of that. And um, yeah, feel free to email us and get in touch with us a bit more if you if you want to. And yeah, maybe before we leave, if there's any final questions, shoot them through now and we'll do our best to answer them. I suppose a, a question I might have for the audience, have you ever connected with China? Have you ever uh, been part of a global collaboration uh, with anyone in China? Do you know anyone in China? Barbara has, yes. And what were the barriers there, Barbara, or the enablers? What, what uh, sort of experiences did you have, I wonder? Deb has as well, that's great. Uh, uh, we see my next exploration. That's a good question. <laughs> um, well, you know, I think once we establish Connect with China, I think it's uh, going through the other countries that I've lived in. I think Connect with Bangladesh would probably be my next one, if anyone, and that's looking another 12 months down the track. But I lived in Bangladesh for four years. It's the most amazing country, the most amazing people. Uh, Govinda, I think you're still with us, aren't you? I mean, I know you lived right next door to Bangladesh over there in Nepal. I've been to Nepal as well, but I think you know, making these valuable connections and building programs that schools and learners can hook into uh, is uh, that's that's part of my mission anyway. And I know uh, Katie works hard at that as well. I think and in yes. the future we're going to see, oh yeah, Nepal, but I was going to say Africa in the future as their technology is growing and you'll see a lot more connection with, uh, I'm speaking like Africa is a country, but you know, the, some of the countries within Africa like Kenya and those type of places, you'll start to see a lot more connection with those guys too using technology. Yes, absolutely, yes. And Katie and I have both got um, strong links to different countries in Africa, so that's a possibility as well in the future. But, you know, we, you can see that our minds are ticking away here. We have, we do have conversations, we have plans, and uh, so, so watch this space, you know, if China, if, if you're interested in China and you have um, opportunity next year, come and join us, but watch this space and uh, we'll see, see what we can develop together. Well, one of the other things we're looking at developing too, and we'll probably host it in our hometown, is we're going to be doing a a future conference here that will bring people from China and different parts of the world and connecting face to face and online to share more of these experiences and get more more of them happening as well. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Well thank you for being such a great audience and being so interactive. Um, and it, it is it really makes it easy for us as presenters uh, when we see um, chats, you know, and comments as we go along because we, we know you're listening. <laughs> uh, Rem says, would that conference be pers in person or virtual? Well, it would be in person, and any conference I run, I always have a virtual component to it as well, so that there would be opportunity to do both. Absolutely. Great. So once again, watch this space. You know, we're we're planning in the background and thank you, a big thank you to Lucy and Steve who just worked like dogs this week. So that might be an Australian term, but <laughs> it's our colloquialism. Um, thank you for this opportunity. We really appreci appreciate everything that you've done uh, to put together this week once again and everyone else who's involved with it. Uh, it's been a great experience for Katie and I to be able to do this together. Thank you. Okay, I think we're done. Thanks again, everyone.
We'll see you in other sessions and we'll see you maybe in Connect with China next year. Bye for now. Thanks, Julie. Thanks, Katie. Sorry I was busy setting up other rooms. Thanks, everybody, for coming. We'll ask you to leave the session room now so the recording can process.